In addition, if you look at it globally, a lot of economic activity of the global output is coming out of Asia. Mm -hmm. So again, some regions have eaten into the Western economic dominance. The U.S. may be technologically dominant. Mm -hmm. The West may be financially dominant. But, you know, they are, they are new growth poles. And people have advanced in different parts uh, of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa remains an outlier in terms of that shift because mm -hmm. Asia has industrialized quite a bit. Yeah. Latin America has industrialized quite a bit. We remain, you know, the area of the largest numbers of, of least developed countries, mm -hmm. uh, most commodity, uh, raw material commodity exports dependent. But even within Africa, you know, there's an example I like to give, which mm -hmm. may be very mundane. Um, the, the floor, mm -hmm. the floor of poverty has risen. Okay. But the inequality between in the floor and the ceiling has worsened. Let me give you an example. One day I was driving around Legon mm -hmm. and I noticed the pile of motorbikes. Mm -hmm. Now these are the motorbikes ridden by those who cut the grass in Legon. Once upon a time, they would have been riding bicycles, if at all. Once upon a time, when somebody had worked for 30, 40 years, you'd be given a long service award of a bicycle. So when I said the floor of a poverty, a yeah, you know, the floor of poverty has risen. Reason. Materially, more people have access to water, to education, to better health, and so on. But if you look at actually the, the, the relativities, yes. inequalities have worsened. So those at the top has, have gone much higher. Yes. And those at the bottom have risen, but yes. not yes. in tandem with I those mean, at the top. If you look at the housing in place like East Legon, yeah. I mean, some of them are obscene. Yeah. And then you go to the crowding and absence of utilities and so on urban rural so we, it's, it's a mix it's and is a mix this picture. what you've said about poverty and the floor is it true globally as well or is this is a ghana situation well i think globally because if, if you, per capita gdp mm -hmm. has risen mm -hmm. there should be some reflection in people's lives yeah. when i went to primary school in jelukofa and pando mm -hmm. okay the son of a civil servant and a teacher mm -hmm. we walk barefooted to school you find more very few kids now mm -hmm. walking barefoot but they are very poor in their relativities they can go nowhere near ghana international sos and you no know, so so the gap so in those days if you were good enough you probably could have gotten to a very good school or if you but now you can be very good but still not be able to afford the, the best quality and with a qualifier of corruption mm. because i was I went to St. Augustine's College. Mm. Uh, I sat at the common entrance. At the school assembly, the head teacher called me and gave me a letter. I didn't, know, I didn't know anybody in, in St. Augustine's. I'd never been to Cape Coast. Okay? Mm. Dr. Chambers tells the same story. Okay? But now kids can qualify. But corruption is a roadblock in addition to the fact that they may not be able to, to, to afford it. Mm. You know? Since you're on this trajectory of comparison, I like the Jericho Pest story. Apart from the fact that Tidoren is 30 next year, uh, 83 is 40 years to now. And I was born in 81, and my parents keep telling me about the hunger in 83. And recently I saw a document talking about how Ghana needed food aid, talking about the diff different things go from different places. So in a sense, it's a bit of a deja vu. My question to you is, how different is 2013 or 2022, 2023 2023. Yes. So this year and last year from 82, 83, in terms of the, the way the economy is struggling, how, what are the differences? Yeah. Number of differences. One, mm. by the time the PNDC came to power mm. at the end of 1981, mm -hmm. Ghana had been in continuous economic decline for a decade. The economy has shrunk by about 20, 25 percent mm. uh, exports of cocoa which was the main crop which reached half a million tons in Nkrumah's time had fallen to less than 200,000 tons okay uh, inflation was through the roof and the country had no foreign exchange and the previous third republic government of president demand actually initiated a discussion with the IMF for a restructuring uh, uh, program 
people used to joke that Ghanaians queued for everything, including toilet roll. Okay? Now, so we, Ghana was a model of African economic decline and crisis. The difference here is that Ghana, for since the mid 80s, has been celebrated as a model of neoliberal economic policy and growth. Continuous growth. What I was describing as the worst inequalities, continued commodity dependence, remained like it was in those, uh, that period of crisis. So the, what we have now, really, of course, uh, we had, the, in, in the case of the PNDC, which came to power uh, just before the in, in, end of 81, we are talking about bushfires mm -hmm. and droughts in 82, 83. We've had the same government in power for six years making claims about the strength of its economic policies. Mm -hmm. We have had policy continuity across the NDC MPP years with more or less you know, intensity in, in areas. Uh, so here we can talk about really we have a, a crisis both of the economic model and also the crisis of economic governance and leadership and policy choices. So it's, 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 some similarities... It's, it's, so you're, you're trying to say this one is a bit more self-imposed because the 83 government probably had inherited a longer term of decline and there were different governments that are coming but you've had six years of the same government and the policies have been similar so that's the first difference but what about the difference in terms of at the time there was a food crisis i'm not sure if there's a food crisis now there was an environmental crisis at the time what are just the pe I don't know how old you were if you can remember because it, people are saying that this is the most difficult time inflation is 54 we are told it's probably the highest yeah. since well uh, I mean those who lived in that period you know people look now there was nothing to buy there was nothing to Even buy if you had the money people queued to buy raw kinky so they could go and boil it at home mm. I was working in government but we didn't have very much as I like to joke I mean the country was so broke that if you were in government, there was nothing to steal. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I mean, wow. As opposed to people helping themselves, left, right, mm. But I think it's important, however, not to. You see, we can talk about policy continuities mm -hmm. up to the even the eve of the PNDC period, to the extent that continuity of a certain set of policies and elite leadership. Okay, so the. In this case, I think it's important because the, some of the elements of the debt crisis that we are dealing with, mm -hmm. some of the elements of the you know, economic policies are not simply attributa attributable to the M MPP. Mm -hmm. The MPP and the NDC have had a consensus about economic policy. The fight really has been about who will be in power and who will be sitting at the edge of the trough and helping themselves and their associates to it can you repeat that ndc and mpp have had a consensus yeah on right. economic policy yes, in broad terms in broad terms yeah because the look, difference is in who comes to power yes i mean look what we are implementing today the foundations were laid by the policy choices of the pndc the pndc jerry rawlings is a benefactor of the Ghanaian elite he con they hate him but he is their godfather he created this economy with the choices made in the 80s some of us left the government because we saw the drift to the right, the choice of neoliberalism, and where it was likely to lead. The reasons why by the end of the rolling period, if you look at the regime's composition, it was no different from any of the preceding military governments. It's precisely because the elite felt comfortable with it. Let me tell you a personal story. I was one of Professor Mills' favorite students in the law faculty. He was very keen on me going to study, finish my PhD, to come to teach in the faculty, because I had a scholarship from the law faculty. So when I decided to give up my studies to come to work for the PNDC, Professor Mills was very angry. And for the seven years that I'd given up my study and I was in Ghana, both working for the government and later on, you know, opposing it, any time Mills saw me, he said, when will you stop this political madness and go and finish your degree and come back to teach? By the time I came back, he was working with Rawlings. Why? Because 
the regime had drifted to a place where well, he was comfortable enough yeah, to work for conservative him. enough for him to join it and wow. if you look at the kinds of people jerry rollins liked justice anan mills, mills and those those are archetypal elite leadership figures this response honest people who could preside over wow. a region so so the policy we need to give we need to go back to that so there's a template that the rawlings era set which kufour mills mahama Every, Kufado, have everybody. not departed significantly from when ghana the imf ghana became mm. the model mm. that the imf took around africa mm. to restructure people's economies mm. to restore their participation in the global economy mm. this was a rawlings model the West had a tension about Jerry Rowling because politically it was unreliable. But the, the economic regime that he set in place was what the West had been trying to do since the NLC. Which means that within, since the NLC. Which means when the Rowling's government, there was obviously division. I'm talking about PNDC now. In which way to go? But and those of you who felt you needed to stay a bit more to the left, you lost out. We did. But you see, to go back to the similarities and differences yeah. in the crisis. Yeah drought bushfires yeah. Ghanaian refugees being expelled yeah. from nigeria mm. you can draw broad similarities with ukraine mm. and the ukraine war and the impact of COVID. but the thing is that those factors mm. landed in a situation of deep crisis i'm talking about the the mm. 81 mm. 82 83 thing the COVID and Ukraine war landed in a situation where Ghana's commodity exports were buoyant, you know, the economy was growing, mm. the country mm. was being celebrated. So important, you know. So uh, things were much worse then before they were hit by the external. Yes, yes. But here, yes. things were going well and then the external. But the underlines were becoming problematic. I was mm. reading a Financial Times article mm. written in early 92. By that time, everybody was predicting that Ghana was heading for a crisis. Mm. The only people who insisted nothing was wrong was going on. Were the people in power? This is 2022. Yes. And I mean, so six years, mm -hmm. people have been predicting that this, you know, debt things are unsustainable, they are probably mm -hmm. the modeling. So, but the, 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 so the PNDC's, uh, the, the response to the crisis, I think it's also important to discuss mm -hmm. because the government, of course, have proclaimed itself a government of the people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that it had was that it had the support of critical social sectors, students, workers, farmers' organizations, and so on. And there's an attempt to reach out mm -hmm. and explain to people mm. the crisis mm. and the need for everybody to make sacrifices. Mm. If you go back and read Jerry Rawlings' speeches in that period, there's a lot of that. On the eve of the 83 budget, which announced a savage devaluation, I was one of a number of people who went around the country meeting with key social leaders to explain to them why certain choices had to be made. Mm. I remember going, for example, Kwesi Bochwe to Tema to meet workers. We traveled, had rallies in Achimoda, Kede, and places to mm. explain to people mm. that there were difficult choices. Right? So within the limits of a coup d'etat regime, there was an effort to, to kind mm. of reach out. And the leadership of the country itself expressed that austerity. In so, the way they live their so lives. So it's just using that analogy. So the announcement to go for an IMF program obviously must have been devastating both to the government and the social forces supporting it. Because and I'm comparing that to this one where there's a government that is, of course, you said the template is not the same, but the finance minister was rather adamant we're not going to go, which I found interesting. He said they don't have anything good for us. He was saying that as early as March, April, May, June, and then in July, the president announced we're going to go. How different was the approach to the IMF at the time to this one? The IMF discussion split the Rollins government and in a way weakened its political in the long term in terms of its relationship with its historic uh, support base. Don't forget that the Liman government had actually gone very far in its discussions with the Bretton Woods institutions about a stabilization program before the coup took place in 81. So, that discussion was a starting point for the internal discussions. One thing I would say is that those of us who were kind of uh, young militants who were in the government, it was 
personally for me, mm. a kind of a learning moment about the complexity of running a country. Because it's one thing having a thesis about the way and the ideal is the reality. Because there was one critical meeting where mm. the discussions were going on and going on and going on. And the deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana at the time, Dr. Mohammed, mm. said, folks, we need to come to some decisions. Mm. Because we have only three weeks for exchange. Mm. Nobody's lending to Ghana. We have trade debts. So one way or the other, we need to make some choices mm. and move on with it. And the key argue, debate was about whether to devalue the currency mm. and by what percentage. percentage. And that decision to devalue the currency was the most significant. Because at the time, it was a fixed exchange rate yeah. regime. It yeah. went from 2.75 overnight to almost 30 CDs overnight. That should topple any government. But it survived because... Of course, believed. there wasn't opposition a lot. No, but this, the base believed. I mean, if you go... So the workers, the teachers, the farmers understood the devaluation. They saw that there was a crisis. Was the devaluation the precondition for the IMF program? Well, even for any going forward, whether you need to realign the exchange rate with your domestic... Certainly. You know, yeah. So the, the exchange rate was false. As in, the, the prior to the devaluation, it was not a reflection of the reality. No, because, I mean, the Champon government alone Mm. That it, it it had printed the amount of money it put in circulation uh, had increased money in circulation by seventeen times in the short time. A temple was in yes. government. Wow! So the devaluation came, and then what about the IMF decision itself for the so, program? So the so if you go back, mm. you could see a, a kind of dual process mm -hmm. at the end of uh, eighty two. Mm -hmm. Kweziboitwe announced a program for reconstruction and development, mm -hmm. which contained the elements mm -hmm. of where the internal debate mm -hmm. had landed. Mm -hmm. A broad social democratic program. State companies, blah, 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 you know, school things, you know, things. So, and, and also there was a national mobilization program mm -hmm. to create, you know, public works to employ people, you know, get carpenters and mason to repair schools just to a national mobilization program to be managed by the by the structure of the of the of the defense committees that program never took off wow my own sense mm -hmm. is that i miss the political turmoil that in the late uh, late 82 after the the disagreement about uh, the economic program those internally who felt that our best choice was to go to the IMF basically prevailed so this would include the then finance minister Kwesibot. yeah I would think so uh, I mean it took a while as some of the promises that were made in 83 were not being implemented for questions so people started asking but you told us that we're going to do ABC just for point of interest who were the people opposed to the IMF deal I'm, I'm, I'm supposing that those who remained agreed so yeah. that for you, you left. No, I, 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 no, I remember. You, you stayed for a while. When yes. did you leave? I left at the end of '84. No, I was, I was, but that's like, a very short time. Yeah, 81, but, so '81, '84, in, 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 three years. In the debate, I mean, if you read some of the books written by some of my ex colleagues who went into exile yeah. in '83, I'm the, I'm the, uh, the, the devil in the plot because I was a very key actor in the internal debates. Mm. And there's a report people refer to as the Graham Report, which mm. summarized, you know, the so discussions who was, who about was, the. Who were the most vociferous opponents? Uh, I would say that broadly. All of us on the left were opposed to the IMF, mm. but there were differences about how we saw the imperative of devaluation mm. in terms of moving the economy forward. Can we say some people conflated devaluation with the IMF? Can, of course, for every country, recent Egypt went for IMF program. They had to devalue to get the program. Mm. So there's always, as you said, you need to align before you go. Can we say the debt exchange as a consequence of the they call the so-called debt restructuring? Mm -hmm in 2023 mm -hmm. is what the devaluation was in 82 83 well not really as a precondition to the program and as the the most the most important macroeconomic variable that needs to be aligned a debt sustainability plan mm. i think is nice because external debt is a key factor yeah. in the ghanaian i mean the debt indebtedness is a key factor yeah. in this uh, in the ghanaian situation today um but public expenditure mm also because i mean for i mean people have remarked the unrealistic gap between 
expenditure projections and revenue. And for years, that has been filled by borrowing. Mm -hmm. So you need to bring some realism into, into that. I'll take a break and let you develop that point. This is the point of view. The topic we have <laughs> coined is economic matters arise, and Dr. Graham has been in this place for many years, helping us just appreciate some key economic issues. We started off by looking at the comparisons between 83, 84, and now. We'll come and look at the debt exchange in a bit more detail, and then we'll talk a bit also about the gold for oil deal, which appears to be the government's main solution to the currency depreciation, and also discuss the Japa and resource issues and revenue. Stay with us. What? Manji's school for Nisikao, they are the future generation. And now, five guys say, Omuni Naja, Mowale, Manju, Bieska. But Chani Kuka, what? I don't know how. Come on, you're trying to pull up. You're trying to hurt. It's a music joke, and I got it. Some things are best taken hot, like delicious creamy mixing. Mm. Mm. Grammy, and the mini scow. Master, with all due respect, and now I'm for Hey, Spanish. Mixy Choco, choco mix now in a new pack with a great new taste. Mixy mix Choco, Mixy mix Coffee. Mix Channel mix Hot. Mix this advert is FDA approved. <laughs> We give you extra so you can go further. Get two months of Showmax for the price of one. It's giving double any day. It's giving celebration, Ankasa. All that scandal. It's giving the perfect storm. More epic thrills and detective vibes. You go feel, sa. It's giving what it's supposed to be giving and overdose. So subscribe now to get two months for only 16 Ghana CDs 99 pesos for a limited time. It's giving Showmax. Welcome back to the Point of View. Tonight we're talking to Dr. Al Graham, who is the coordinator of the Third World Network. They are advocates. I think they are, they are policy advocates. And we're trying to discuss economic matters arising. So the debt exchange has been presented as the inevitable pill we have to take if the economy should not collapse. Is, is that really the situation? I, dis I disagree. I mean, I think getting to a, a, a sustainable debt level mm -hmm. is necessary okay uh, but many people will tell you that domestic debt mm. you don't don't domestic debt is structuring because of its systemic implications for the country mm. it is not advisable so in general the thing is to focus on your external debt relations okay because all this resistance of the banks and so on pensioners all those things are telling you just the the the, mm. the, the systemic uh, implications so in front loading the uh, the domestic debt exchange program as a primary step mm. and being very resistant to legitimate demands from citizens that we need to take a look at public finance public finance you know how things are being spent you know where money is coming from to get value for money some things can be postponed okay i mean the, the resistance to that conversation is very striking it's very very striking i mean to have a situation where amidst all these things the president could actually 
sound like he will prioritize money going to a national cathedral, you know, is the most egregious example of this. People have a sense of waste and corruption, and they want to get a sense of a readiness to deal with it, okay, if they are going to make sacrifices. That discussion does not seem to be on the table. That does not create trust for a start. And to get people to make sacrifice, you need to build legitimacy for your program. Because it's, it's, it's an intangible, so the, so that does it. That's the, that, so the DDE really, one of its effects, both in terms of process, where really the finance minister has been extremely arrogant in terms of his relationship with the people who are the, the victims of this exercise, which also explains why it has taken so long. They keep rolling and moving. I mean, the changing of the dates and so on and the terms is also a statement of incompetence. That you didn't think through it properly, you didn't engage properly, and you keep rolling along. Mm -hmm. So you go back to people in the party who have questioned the continuation office of the finance minister. And for them, as a ruling party, this must be even more embarrassing that everything they feared is coming to pass. But the DD, I think, is really hammered you know, the legitimacy. Of, of, of this government. So and it, sh of it, shouldn't, it shouldn't have been front-loaded. You're saying that restructuring obviously should be done, possibly starting with external, yeah. and front-loading and as in making it the first thing to do is obviously wrong. So what... And it's also a political disaster. So, so your point, is, so we could have done a fiscal adjustment, revenue increase, which I'll come to, expenditure cutting, before trying to now get into a debt issue. So they've sort of turned the cart before the horse. Yes. That's, that's your feeling. Yes. I see. You people did a structural adjustment. What's the difference between a structural adjustment and a fiscal adjustment? No, the fiscal adjustment is a fairly narrow thing. They are talking, I'm talking, uh, my thing here is about revenue expenditure. expenditure. Good. Structural adjustment really, as everything. you evolve, put everything on the table. Public sector reform. So where we are now, do we need a structural adjustment, a fiscal adjustment, or what do we need? Medium, long term. We've always needed structural transformation. Medium, long term. We've always so. If you were advising the minister of any government, a, a, a government in Ghana, in October 2022, when the currency fell by over 50 percent, mm. and your your reserves are being eroded, mm. and the IMF was on the horizon, what would you have advised in that period between October last year to December? The first thing mm. I think we should have done mm. that broadcast the president made where he said there will be no haircut he must be embarrassed mm. by what's going on yeah that speech in my view should have said fellow countrymen and women mm. we have a crisis mm. which is going to require a lot of sacrifice of all of us mm. which is forcing us as a government to rethink the ways we do business mm. And we intend to do A, B, C, D to reduce public expenditure. We'll try and protect some things which we think are key, and that's entirely legitimate. If you go to the example of, say, uh, 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 Barbados, Barbados, yeah, the uh, the was it Jamaica? Barbados, you know, this uh, uh, Prime Minister, okay. you know, Mia Motley, they said we'll do a that's restructuring. Mm. But we protect education, health, and we also need to provide for the effects of hurricanes mm. because we are a small island. Yeah. Everything else is on the table to discuss. So the president brings us in, mm. said we have a crisis as a country, and me, as a leader in my government, this is what we are going to do. So what else can you also do? So, and these me? are some of the things we'll do mm. which will require sacrifices from you. Mm. With that, everybody is on board. Is on board. It will not be easy, mm. but it improves the climate. And then different constituencies are brought into the conversation. People are talking about senior high school, mm. inefficiencies. People are not saying it's a bad idea. Inefficiencies in the program. The president keeps saying, we can't even review it. Let's look at it. Let's look at this. Labadi Polyclinic do you has, get been, has been, do has been do demolished do you get the sense to be rebuilt. The president it's, it's has a different reality to what everybody else outside is seeing in terms of the obvious things you said, National Cathedral, making the sacrifice. He seems to be, if you mentioned the FT article, it, it, seems, it seems as if our economic policy makers are living in a different 
reality or is it just being obstinate Be because of what you're saying is very, very very obvious to me that is what ought to be done or is it that when you are in office you see things different therefore you can't <laughs> but it's clear from what the parliamentary caucus mm. is demanding mm. that there's a disconnect mm. between the presidency and even the the caucus in even his party yes look for the majority leader mm. to come out to criticize yeah the dd yeah tells you something yeah, yeah. it tells you something you know for former chief justice so far kufu to be sitting in the picket tells you also the crisis mm. of legitimacy mm. that the regime is facing so at the minimum mm. there's a refusal to see the reality that people are seeing which can be described as arrogance and insensitive mm. okay the president i have always felt is very concerned about legacy okay i mean there are many things that the government has proposed which are good ideas senior high you know uh ghana without aid adding value industrialization fantastic ideas it is when we come to the details the details of what is you know happening yeah that there is one problem. of the big problems they faced is the depreciation oil for gold sorry gold for oil appears to be one of their main big ideas in solving that I don't know if you've seen that policy document, yeah. but the way it's been implemented, it will. Live, uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts? I think it's a crisis management approach. Crisis management approach. It's crisis management. Mm. It's crisis management. Mm. I mean, it is not. I mean, let's not dress it up as some profound innovation, which somehow mm. you know generations of policymakers have missed out on. Mm. One. How much gold is the government likely to be able to buy? To allow it to buy the oil. The government is only be going to be able to provide a proportion mm -hmm. of the of the oil and the first consignment was bought with cash it was only when people came out to start asking questions particularly the uh, civil society uh, alliance on extractives anti-corruption and good governance when they that the government published a policy framework you know the, the uh, you know about a week ago and many questions can be raised about about the, the policy but go, starting from the gold part of it, first of all, the agreements that the large-scale mining companies have means that the government cannot insist on buying the, the gold. They can only buy some of it, and we agree twenty percent of it. Whilst you're talking, I'm showing a chart of Ghana's three main exports, at least gold, cocoa, and oil, from December 2021, 2022, just showing the proportions. And gold seems to be a uh, in terms of dollar revenue, our, our largest mm. cocoa being actually oil and cocoa alternating as second and third. So, whilst we are talking, so you go on. Yes. So, the agreements are a lot of them are locked. So, you have only a percentage of the gold that you can actually buy. Yes. So, that's the first problem. Although the revenue may come back to the country when yes. they deducted their yes. expenses. Yeah. So, I'm still trying to work out. They have read the explanation, yeah. but I think that it's a crisis management. Because they are saying the people, when they sell the gold on their own, they keep the money offshore and we know there's a problem with identifying other things so if i buy the gold from you here mm -hmm. in local currency mm -hmm. at least i have control of mm -hmm. the, the pressure that you're keeping your money outside mm -hmm. places on my dollar is no longer there that's the logic behind yeah, i understand it. Yes. but i'm saying that it's only part of your oil okay it's, it's not even half Mm. of the country's oil consumption mm -hmm. it may ameliorate mm. the impact mm. if the government intervene in the market but you know a number of questions were raised by the civil society alliance for example the absence of uh, the selection criteria the people who are going to buy the gold the bidex yes how are they going to be I mean, oh know, sorry yeah, even, yeah into the yes, gold yeah. yes well, who are these people mm -hmm. uh they who are going to supply the oil what's the selection criteria mm -hmm. okay uh the non disclosure of the pricing policy that the government is using for selling the gold um, the petroleum policy uh, the pricing for the petroleum products um, lack of clarity about how the transaction costs under the program will be covered mm -hmm. okay uh, non-disclosure of the means by which the government intends to raise money mm -hmm. to finance these gold purchases these are all questions which have been raised about the transaction mm. and in fact 
the small scale miners mm -hmm. feel discriminated against. Because whilst the government is buying only a proportion of the large scale gold, it intends to buy all of the gold of the small scale people. But they point out that their business model, in many cases, people actually pre finance. So the gold is not sitting there to be appropriated. So it will tell you also that, I mean, there's not even enough attention paid to the business model, at least of the small scale, when assuming that all that gold will be available to be bought to support the, the, the scheme. So it, 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 wow. So you don't feel it, it's a long term solution to our depreciation? You see, the fact that it is only in this crisis that they thought through that this thing has come sure, itself tell tells you something. Okay. Let, let's come to a Japa then, because again the problem they seem to they want to solve on paper we don't get enough from our, our uh, natural resources using minerals and you've written a lot about that for both the african level and the Ghanaian level at least that was the pitch you were given before the deal was put out in public yet you are one of those who have said that it is a wrong-headed policy it's not going to benefit us it's actually going to probably worsen things just next three four minutes. Just explain why you are so opposed to the Japan deal. Two main things. One, the valuation. Mm. And two, the process. Okay. And also some other aspects mm -hmm. in terms of the offshore thing, you know, in the tax haven, you know, and and uh, and the parties who are involved. If you take the 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 the, the office. Office of Special Prosecutor's report. Yeah. It goes in quite a lot of detail yeah. about the process, corruption risk, you know, issues. And and part of the thing has to, to do with the fact that there's always been a sense of self serving policy choices, you mm. know, in this in this government. But the valuation was a central thing. Mm -hmm. I mean they had a valuation uh, range of uh, I think around about five hundred uh, Dollars mm -hmm. going to 750. I forgot they had no seven, uh, seven something as the I have that. Yes. So the guidance range is the price projection on which the Japan valuation was, was given. I'm putting this on the screen mm -hmm. as well. So you have a Japan valuation against gold spot prices mm -hmm. for 20 yeah. years between the year 2000, where you are about 250, mm -hmm. all the way to 2020, which is around 1500 ish. Mm -hmm. Let me find my and that range that they got so if, if, you, if you look at the middle line where we put the guardians range so your point is that the guardians range is way below yeah because the, the gold prices that we've had yes, since 2000 so have it. since 2008 yes you know this thing and if so are the, way higher than the way, way higher. so they so undervalued the, the gold, gold was undervalued mm. and once you do that anybody who buys a japa stock is in a good place mm -hmm. because there will be appreciation yes so the question that people are asking that and all the other questions about corruption risk yeah. the smell of insider trading and benefit but it is linked also to a wider element of the strategy of this government the excessive securitization of things Not so the, the fundamental problem they want to solve is good the approach they choose is what you disagree yes. with and the process they use what you agree with yes yes but, because i was going to show you this chart table five mm -hmm. from i and i wanted to look at it from ifs where Ghana's average percentage revenue they get from extractives mm -hmm. is less than 20%, mm -hmm. way below all comparables. Mm -hmm. And this has been for many, many years. It's almost as if our focus on royalties, corporate tax, still don't give us anything near averages. Why, and I'm putting this on the screen as well, why, why are we so poor at getting even revenue from our, uh, from our, from our extractives? Uh, is the contracts that we've signed? The contracts are badly the, written. They are bad the contracts we agree to we are involved in writing them but we have so many lawyers three thousand yeah, but, you know, if, if, <laughs> no, but if the lawyers feel that they should serve the companies and some other interests mm. rather than the public interest this is what we so get. the problem starts with the contracts take, let's take gold mm. in 20 when gold prices went up when gold prices went up from particularly around 2003 mm -hmm. it kept rising mm -hmm. it got really to to a peak uh, around 2014 when it was almost more than 1800 across the world because commodity prices went up many countries took measures to renegotiate yeah. their contracts and also to change 
the fiscal regimes. Under the Mills government, similar initiatives were taken. We raised the goal royalty rate to 5%. Was that the Akila Pasoya work? Yes, to, we raised the thing to 5% and mm -hmm. so on. By 2016, under Mahama, mm -hmm. that whole thing had been collapsed. Because the government gave... No, let me go back a bit. Newmont had been given a terrible regime by Kufo with a 40-year stability clause, which meant that really we're not going to get anything worth the name from it. Terrible agreement. Terrible, which many people considered even potentially unconstitutional in terms of some of these elements. The Akil Akpasoya committee was set up to review that mm. and lay out some principles for managing fiscal regime in gold. The Newmont, the new Newmont agreement improved the Newmont on the old Newmont terms. But because of the stability clauses, there's only so much they could do. They, I mean, it was a renegotiated thing. So the agreement brought it up, but it was still outside. So the, the regime that Mills created, the Newmont agreement was outside it. Now, the company started pressing that they should be treated like Newmont, forgetting that Newmont was an agreement which had been renegotiated, whereas they were under a different regime. Anyway, in 2016, the government decided to lower, to create a new tax framework. Although it's purported to be graduated, it effectively offered all the other companies a tax rate lower than the 5%, wow. which was you know, in the law. And in applying it, we mm. argue that it was even illegal because section 48 and this is the mahama government yes section 48 same party yeah well <laughs> how does know, that work but it just tells them what i'm talking about the continuities you know uh, the section of the uh, minerals uh, uh, minerals and mining act that they refer to does not justify because this it doesn't allow a retrospective so you're basically attitude. saying Kufour gave we are applying an illegality let me just put that in english you could before give newmont a deal that was terrible for the country. Yes. Mills tried to change that with Akira Basoya work. Yes. Mahama came and then essentially didn't go back to what Kufo did, but essentially close. Yes. Offer, for all everybody. Yeah, it gave, yeah the, the improved new mountain, which was worse than what existed to everybody. And thereby lowered, you know, the wow. revenue. We'll let that sink in. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll try and work our way around the, the way forward. Because I have in front of me something again and i like to go back into history ashanti gold corporation government at 55 percent equity interest was the most profitable gold mining company in ghana right in 1988 of course we sold what we had in it to who would buy it where are we today what lessons can we learn from not just that but even our oil and gas is it time to get into production sharing agreements and not just focus on revenue Revenue, royalty. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Pepsodent introduces Chaco and Lemon Essence. The unique combination of natural essences whitens teeth naturally for you and family because every smile matters. New Pepsodent Herbal. Introducing a unique combination of herbal extracts in an antibacterial toothpaste for strong teeth and healthy gums that protects your family and you. Every smile matters. Extra, so you can go further. Tell me one mixy choco. Hot! Mixy choco. Tell me hot. Choco, one more. Tell me 
What? Manji's school for Nisiko, they are the future generation. And now, five guys in the same Omunina, Jamu Wallet, Manju, Bieska. But Chani Kuka, what? I don't know how. Come on, you can't pull up. It's not hot. It's a music joke. I'm not happy. Come on, back away. Some things are best taken hot, like delicious creamy mixing. Mmm. 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 Grammy, and the minute cow. Massa, with all due respect, and now I'm going to Hey. Mix it choco now in a new pack with a great new taste. Mix it choco, mix it coffee. Turn off all. This advert is FDA approved. Welcome back. This is the point of view. We're still talking. Economic matters are rising. Quick back to securitization. You said a Japa you didn't like because it was one of a series of securitizations. Yes. Can you name a few others? Yeah, let me, let me reformulate that actually. Yes. I mean, the point I was making about the securitization is that mm. it was also illustrative of the way in which future revenue streams mm -hmm. were being interdicted. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in a climate where people don't trust the way government is spending to front load revenue in that way means that future governments have been deprived of the, the opportunity. And the intergenerational equity that you want from your minerals is also being undermined. I am going through something that tells us what happened to AGC. This is 88, you had left government in the 80s and then early 90s. My thinking is, if we are not getting enough revenue, mm -hmm. it is not a way to go. Is it, is it not time we, we co-produced? So let's assume somebody comes to do exploration, whether it's uh, HES or ICA or TALO. Should the strategy not be we entering a production sharing instead of always focusing on just the revenues, corporate tax, royalties, that type of thing? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah. First, just to complete the point I was making about the mm -hmm. agreements. Yes. You go to the oil and gas sector. Mm -hmm. The Gensa agreement, yeah. where we are giving away, you know, calculated uh, what could be equivalent to even the money we are going to get from at least half, or could potentially almost all the money we are asking of the IMF from just one deal, mm -hmm. where you know GMPC is selling gas at more than seventy-five percent discount. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any economic sense. Mm -hmm. We have various agreements which are like that. So the oil sector is full of these kinds of deals which are benefiting you know, a few people. So even if we focus on revenue, we are not optimizing the revenue that we ought to be getting because of the kinds of agreements that we have for a variety of reasons. Corruption, patronage. So basically whatever. the politicians who lead these, you think they benefit and therefore they will sign these bad deals for the country. If you don't benefit, yeah, somebody is benefiting. Because it has to be incompetent. Because the, the if, one if, because if it's so say. evident that they did is so poor, and yet they push it through, it has to be that yeah, they are benefiting it's, it's, or they don't of, understand. There's a lot of incompetence. Because Goldfields, for example, mm. had said, if we sign this agreement, we will employ more people. Within two years, they've laid off all their workers. And nobody has followed up. Because that was up. not put in the agreement. How can you not put in? Well, the agreements are there. You can go the ahead. agreements don't have environmental and employment clauses? No. It's just revenue. It's basically a development. If we invest so much, you we'll get this you this, yeah, get it So back to the question about production then. Because yes. the, the other point about revenue is one of the reasons we get less revenue is that somebody can... Look, I will tell you my cost. Mm -hmm. But if I'm co-producing mm -hmm. and you say you used X amount to produce and therefore your profit is this percentage mm -hmm. and therefore I'll get this percentage mm -hmm. of profit tax. If we are producing together, mm -hmm. you cannot hide or inflate your production cost because i mean it with you yeah, right but, but, uh, is but, that not a solution but at the end of the day though mm -hmm. even a production sharing agreement yeah has to agree some formula all right for who is getting going to get what percentage mm -hmm. so the principle of production sharing itself does not guarantee you a certain quantity i think mm -hmm. the the thing about the primacy mm -hmm. of public interest which you bring to the table mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. kind of wasting resource mm -hmm. thing that you bring to the team and also the quality of your institutions mm -hmm. because i mean do we even really know 
how much is being produced in all the sectors? Do we have the, the institutions who are seeing that? In mm. addition to the revenue issue, mm. your thing about production sharing also raises the question about who owns what assets in the mineral economy. Mm. Because the benefit of mineral exploitation should not be limited only to revenue. Okay? I mean, who are the service providers? Mm. How much are workers being paid? Mm. What development benefits are coming to the mining affected communities? What even are the alternative potential land use choices? Because we have this attitude that once we find gold, we should dig it. But if it is a fact that most of the gold is in the high forest, that's just the accident of geology. You may, you may get better land use choices. So I'm saying that actually, we, that before you even discuss revenue, or in addition to revenue, Consider mm. the fact that you're already producing the gold. Yeah. There are also bigger questions. So the, this whole conversation about the Voltaian, the Voltaian Basin, we are discovering, you are not a fan of that. You think we should take our time and think about what we want to do with the mineral, whether I want to even touch it. Yes, That's because if you take the Voltaian Basin, for yeah. example, we've got oil sands there, mm -hmm. we've got gas, mm. and we've got oil and gas deposits. Now, this is 40% of the mm -hmm. country's land mass, yeah. in an area of the Volta Lake and so on and so forth. In a period when there's serious discussion about moving away from fossil fuels, okay, energy transition, and, 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 and also the potential of fossil fuel assets becoming stranded. Mm. If we look at our experience or what we have not got out of mm. out of oil, what's the guarantee that we'll get anything? Why should we be despoiling mm. and make uh, destroying the opportunities for alternative land use choices by starting to produce oil in the Voltaic you know, basin? When our experience is that there's been capture mm. of the oil sector by companies and their domestic wow. allies. I suspect the discussion around extractives we have not fully scratched, but we would leave it here for now because I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to invite you back at some point. So thank you for your insights. We spend a lot of time on history, but history is important because those who do not learn from history are bound to repeat it. So Dr. Agram is the coordinator of Third World Network. He's been talking to us on what we call economic matters arising. And we have been discussing DDE, Japa deal, oil for gold or gold for oil and all of those things. Thank you for watching. Uh, we hope to bring him back at some point in the future to, to wrap up this very important conversation around resource governance. We'll be with you next time. Stay with CCTV. Bye-bye.